Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Charles from the channel Books on Stereo, and I'm here to bring you my interview with the one, the only, Kurt Graves. Now, there are some recommendations that Kurt was not able to get to in the video itself, but I'll link those down in the description box down below as well. You can find all his different social media links down in the description box as well. And without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this video as much as I had talking with Kurt. And without further ado, let's start the video. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is Charles from the channel Books on Stereo, and I have like one of my favorite narrators here today on my channel. I have the one and only Kurt Graves. But the first question I wanted to start us out with is like, how did you get into narrating audiobooks? Was it something that you always wanted to do or was something that you kind of stumbled into? Oh, definitely I stumbled into it. Um, and like a lot of narrators, it just kind of started with finding out that somebody I knew was doing it. And I thought, well, I can do that. If you can do that, I can do that. Um, and also not at all at that point understanding how much work it was, what the potential was. I really thought of it at that point as like, oh, this could be a cool side hustle or hobby that makes me a little bit of money. Um, but backing up, part of the reason why I thought I can do that was um, I am a, a forensics speech and debate kid. Like... I did that in high school. It was like where I found my tribe. Um, and then I coached speech and debate in high school for 15 years. So mm -hmm. I had for all that time been working on interpreting prose and poetry and working with young people to find pieces that spoke to them. And in very short periods of time, like 30 minute coaching sessions, trying to get a 15 year old to understand a piece of literature <laughs> and be able to like connect to it and emote and bring forth characters. Um, there's also acting categories in speech and debate uh, where one actor is playing like 10 different people. And so it's about finding easy ways to distinguish characters from one another. And so I've been doing that in some way, shape or form for 20 years, first as a competitor, then as a coach. And then I found out that audiobooks could be produced from home, a friend of mine was doing it. I had been podcasting, so I had some equipment and a little bit of technical knowledge. Um, so I was like, I'll give it a shot. Not thinking it would be a big deal. Not thinking it would be a job. Just something fun to do. And so I signed up on ACX, which is where a lot of narrators get their start. And um, I did about 20 auditions, got 19 no's, and then TJ Klune picked me to do Wolf Song, and that was like... That was your first? Beginning. That was my very first audiobook. What? I had no idea what I was doing. I recorded it in a closet, a coat closet. You're um, kidding me. No, that uh, audiobook like, is legendary. In the it is still community. to this day the most popular thing I've ever done, which is terrifying. That's, that's when I crazy. tell other narrators that, they, like, they, don't, they can't even comprehend what that means. But it's like, yeah, the most popular book I've ever done, the most ratings on Audible, the thing I hear about the most, the high, like, it's Wolf Song, the very first book I ever recorded. And, what a and that book is book. long, too. It's like 18 hours long. And it was my very first audiobook. And I didn't realize that that's not normal. Like, TJ writes really long books. So, and I, I, I didn't know at that point how to punch and roll, which is when you're in the booth and you kind of stop and then go back in the track and then insert new audio in the right spot. So by the time you're done, you have like a finished file. I was just open recording. So I was doing like, if I messed up a line, I just kind of like paused and then I set, set it again. And then I had to, at the end of that process, listen to the whole damn thing <laughs> and go in and like erase every time there was like a repeated line or there was like a weird noise that came in from outside. Cause again, I was just in the closet. Like it was, <sighs> yeah. So, so that was my start. And because of that auspicious beginning, like other people wanted to work with me because there was a perception that I knew what I was doing, which to be clear, I did not. So I, I quickly got some coaching and, um, and uh, eventually a couple years later, it got to the point where I could actually start submitting myself for regular work. I was also... Um, I had been a, a traveling salesperson for a couple of years, and so I listened to a ton of audiobooks, which, if anything got me through that first project, it was that. 
Like the listening was the best training combined with the forensics training of knowing what you can do with your voice to make yourself sound different. Cause there were also just a ton of characters in that book. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was like, Oh, they all have to sound different in a way that like now I would approach it very differently. But at the time I was like, they all have to sound very different <laughs> versus like, they need to be clear in the moment but maybe they don't all have to sound like totally different people. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, sometimes people in real life sound similar, but like you can tell in a, in a scene, which one is talking. That's the important part. No, no, no. I had to give every single one of them their own voice. I think for the most part, like the consensus is you need to make it clear who is speaking in the scene. Um, but there is definitely sort of, a more traditional viewpoint. I'm trying not to say old school because I don't want to call people old. But, but. <laughs> there is a, a certain line of thinking that your job is just to read the book. Mm. And that's, we have text to speech if we want mm-hmm. someone to robotically read a book for us. My My guess is that those people who prescribe to that line of thinking would say that they do still emote they just don't like they don't focus on vocalizations they don't worry so much about accents you know if someone ages in the book they're not worried about giving them a different voice at the beginning to the end Um, so while they may be connecting with the text and delivering a performance there are a lot of those things that i think people expect now that they once upon a time they didn't in fact, I think once upon a time, publishers didn't want that. And it took time and more actors getting involved and showing how great a performance can be, even with different voices, trying to do different accents, like really giving those performative pieces to an audiobook and proving that like, oh, listeners like that. They like it not only for clarity, but they like it because it's it's fun to listen to. So yeah. Definitely. And I think now just just with the explosion of audiobooks, the narrators have become almost like celebrities in and of themselves as just as important as the writer. Like for me personally, if I see you narrate a book and I've never heard of the author, I will at least give it a try. Because I know I know the narrator and what that narrator brings to the project. Yeah. And you're kind of a big name, you know, in kind of like the MM romance space as well as some YA. Was that intentional? you wanted to pick up projects in that in that genre um why was a bit more intentional i did i'm i'm actively trying to steer myself in that direction as well as romance um i landed in romance completely by accident and again it was because of tj um because at that point he really was considered a romance writer even though his Mm -hmm. books definitely veered in a lot of different directions it wasn't just about the central relationship it was about a lot of different things and he writes in a lot of genres even though they were all considered romance at that time um so that i mean that's where i ended up because that's where his readers were and lovely people like you said things like oh i really like that narrator if he narrates another book i'd buy it and authors pay attention to that and then they gave me more jobs so I mean, I can't overstate what that exposure did at the beginning of my career. And, and, and again, like, I didn't even really try for a couple years and, until a couple years after that. Like, I knew I would do any sequel that TJ wrote. Um, he gave me another book right away, Murmuration, that he had written and had plans to do an audio. Um, but I think I did, like, five books my first year and maybe, like, three or four my second because I, like, I had a job and a life and I didn't know how to scale doing audiobooks into a a gig Mm -hmm. so plus it takes time to get out there and get noticed Mm -hmm. and so why the interest in YA I know I noticed you um I forget the title of the book but I saw it all over your Instagram um it's an upcoming YA title like and they live happily ever after it's just called and they lived dot 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 I want to do more YA because with all due respect to every other writer out there, I think YA is where the most exciting fiction is happening right now. And I think it's where the most diverse fiction is happening right now. And I want to be a part of it. So that's why I want to do YA. And I love doing gay YA. 
I want to do as many queer stories as I possibly can across the spectrum of all the other types of books. And, and I want to do every type of book. Maybe not as much nonfiction as I maybe once thought. <laughs> once upon a time, I would have been like, oh, no, I want to do it all. Now I'm like, eh, do I? Do you do that? Do I? <laughs> so would you consider doing like um, an F romance, like thrillers I, maybe? I have, yeah. As well? I have and will. Oh, okay. oh that's yeah. amazing. So uh, it's, but it's funny because like the the romance community is so intense that's mm -hmm. not true in other genres mm -hmm. and those and the genres are very siloed so like i can do a pretty popular mystery romance that is a multicast and it makes it onto like audible's top 10 for a few weeks and nobody in the romance community has any idea that i was a part of that book because <laughs> no. it's not a romance so they're like uh, i don't know don't care like so, that doesn't seem like a romance kurt what are you doing yeah and it wasn't but you know, it's one it's one it. of those things that like it's 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 intense and loving and lovely. And uh what you said about narrators sort of becoming celebrities, I think that's mostly true in romance as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't hear that from other people as much. But yes, I have definitely had to get comfortable with the idea that there are people in the world who will be excited to meet me. Hey, I'm, and I'm like, all right. I'm like, okay, happy, happy, but I hope I don't disappoint you because I'm just no, this never, guy, never just this dude over here in, in Wisconsin, you know, trying to trying to make good stories with, with really great authors. So, um, and let's let's make sure we talk more about And They Lived. So, do I want to get into like, what does your normal audiobook process look like? It could be for romance or YA. How do you normally um, prep the book beforehand? How does your recording process look like in the studio? And what does your um your look your work kind of work life balance? Sorry, work after you finish recording and you're in post production for an audio book. So it kind of take us through your whole flow. Yeah, I mean it varies a lot from project to project because uh, there are different production houses, different publishers. They have their own set way of doing things. Um, sometimes even when you're working independently with authors, they will have worked with someone else. And so they'll have a way that they like to do things. Um, and not that I would change my process entirely for someone, but if they, if they were like, Hey, my last narrator did this for me and it wasn't like too much extra work. And it's just like a little bit of a change for me. I, I can do that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but for the most part, the process starts when, I read the book. So I read the book. I at the beginning, like I I saw so many people online and like the narrator groups, and they like would show pages where they had like everything highlighted and they had like 10 different notes and read all along the margins. And they were like putting their pronunciation notes and little I like if somebody said something angrily, they'd put it at the beginning of the sentence. So they knew to say it angrily right from the beginning. Um, and so I tried to do some of that when I was first getting started. And I have just learned that it's not for me. I don't need that. Um, it, it, it gets in my way when I'm trying to actually interpret the book and, and give a performance. So for me, really, it is about reading the book. It is about knowing what happens in the story. I don't need to read it in great detail. Um, so it's, it, if it's a brand new author, I will spend a bit more time, especially with like maybe the first third or first half of the book so I can understand their style and their voice. Um, but then I start to skim because by that point, I only need the major details. I just need to make sure that like somebody in chapter 21 doesn't turn out to have a German accent or, you know, somebody who's been the yeah. good guy until chapter 19 is suddenly the bad guy. And like, yeah. I really, or, oh. or what sometimes, like what sometimes happens is like, Oh, those were the same people. The bad guy was actually this person. And I didn't do that at like, so those, like you just want to avoid the pitfalls. Mm -hmm. um, so I read to understand the voice to understand the world that's been built. Once I have that, I skim to make sure I know all the major details. And then I just get in the booth and, and go for it. Um, I was, as a student, I was always very good at like, I was, go I was a good high school student because 
I could remember enough of whatever we were studying to do really well on the test. And then I would move on. Um, I've, I've been in a lot of shows where like, you have to learn things quickly. You have to learn music and learn choreography. And, and I, I always pick things up very quickly. And the second I don't need it, it's out of my brain. So the <laughs> nice thing know. about audiobooks is I, I read the book. I have it in my head and I can, I can jump into the booth and, and, remember what the tone of this scene was. So I, I don't need to write angry at the beginning because I remember what the tone of the scene was. I'm also <laughs> fortunate that I work with a lot of great authors. Excuse me. I work with a lot of great authors who make it clear what the tone of voice is even before they have the dialogue tag that says he said it angrily. <laughs> so sometimes like I'm going along and then I read the dialogue tag and I was like, oh, good guess. Um, but really that's because like the author did their job in setting that up that it's like, oh, I was already interpreting that correctly. And if I don't, if I get it wrong, if I, if I hit the end of the line and I was so sincere and then it says, he said sarcastically, I go, oops. And <laughs> I, jump I, go back. Back I was like, jump back 15 seconds, do it again, yeah. move on. So um, I, I don't, I'm not a writer. I don't annotate a bunch of stuff on the page. I, I like to have a clean page, read the book. Um, where I get in trouble with that is I, I'm not great at remembering to like do a clip of a character voice. And then if I end up doing the series and it's like six months later, I'm doing book two. I don't remember any, <laughs> anything I did last time. Because again, I used it and I let it go. Mm -hmm. So that's when I have to go back and like listen to parts of the last book that I did because I was like, oh, I forgot. So I, I need to get better at that. But like I've also been saying that for like four years and I don't know that I'm ever going to get better at it. Hey, as long as we get more audiobooks from you, I'm fine. I mean, hey, I'm fine. You can, you can take it. You can take a break. God willing. And, and go back and, re and listen to your old audiobooks and yeah. then like, just keep, just keep the new audio. Oh, but I mean, it happens. It happens almost on the daily because I do a lot <laughs> of series now, almost on the daily where I'm like going through the book and everything's fine. And I've got my flow and my rhythm. And I like, I remember the main characters, but then somebody will talk and I'll be like, damn it. What did this person sound like? <sighs> so it's like, okay, go back to the last book, do a search in the script to find out where they spoke. Okay, it was chapter 17. Go pull up chapter 17 from the last time. <laughs> Try to guess based on what page it was on, how far into the audio file it is, and then eventually find the voice. Like, Kurt, just record what their voice sounds like and put it in a file somewhere. Just do that past me. But that sounds like that, that, that does sound like a lot of extra work. <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> Past me needs to start doing present me a favor, but present me hasn't learned his lesson. And to um, how does your recording process change with um duet or dual narration? And how do you kind I of haven't find done those any character duet voices? Yet. Okay, I haven't done any duet yet. I'm not, I'm not like eager to jump into that because it sounds difficult. Um, when it comes to dual narration, I have opinions. How many of them am I going to share? I don't love it. Okay. I don't love dual narrations. It is that much harder to do the work because you can't make your own choices mm. all the time. Mm -hmm. The best dual narrations have a lot of really intense communication, which I don't mind. And, and I'd rather have that. And it, if there's not that really good, good communication it can be very frustrating because you have to think about things things like okay chapter 14 i am voicing this character for the first time but i can see that like my co-narrator voiced this character in chapter eight so like wh wh no matter who records first the listener he will hear their version of that character first and if i do it differently i've done it wrong and so you have to think about things like that. And narrators don't always record at the same time. It's very rare that like me and a co-narrator are doing work on the same week where we could just be bouncing ideas back and forth. Like 
either I'm doing it later and they're trying to talk to me and I'm like, I don't know. I haven't done, I haven't prepped that book yet. That's weeks away. Or, or they're like, I'm like trying to ask them questions and they're like, I don't know, dude, I did it a couple of weeks ago. And it's like, oh God, this is... so it's hard. I don't love it. I think from now on, it's going to have to be pretty special projects for me to say yes to dual narrations. Um, just because I'm, I'm so fortunate in that I haven't, like I've had to say no to some work. I'm, my schedule is full. My schedule is beyond full. So I think dual narrations, I'm, I am at this point, I'm literally like thinking as I talk because uh, I'm, I'm still on the fence about this, but like I might not be doing a ton of dual narrations in the future. That was a good um, a follow-up question is that specifically for like MM, romance either in YA or adult, how do you kind of come up with the different voices for your two leads? Do you really look at the characteristics or you kind of, um, cause I assume like sometimes it's just like more gruff sounding voice, more growly and then like a lighter type voice. Mm -hmm. But how do you kind of come up based on the book and the project? How do you come up with those voices? Uh, hopefully whoever is casting the book has done a really good job of putting us with the right person. Um, which sometimes that doesn't happen either. Like I, I remember doing a project a couple years ago where like me and the other narrator got which characters we were. And we both were like, is this right? Like, why would I be doing this person and you'd be doing that person? That doesn't make any sense. So like we both emailed the person who cast and, and we were like, we just want to make sure. Like, is it, is that, is this sure? what, like you want, you want like this person here and this person here. And they were like, yeah, that's what the author asked for. And we were like, huh okay so we both played against type um which can be fun but we were like for both of us we were like this is weird like why would we why would you we both related that? to the other person so much more and had such an easier time doing that character but sometimes you're asked to do things like that and you know what it's your job so do it mm -hmm. um so, but if the casting has been done really well it's easier. And then again, the thing that makes it more fun is when there is that communication and you're working with somebody else who really wants to approach the story as an actor and they want to pay attention to characteristics that the author has given us and they want to create a character that you can then work with. What's hard, and I'm, I'm just thinking like nobody, hopefully who I've worked with is going to see this interview. Um, <laughs> because they might know I'm calling them on the carpet here. Um, what's really hard is when somebody you're working with just says like, oh, I'm doing my standard romance voice. And it's like... Wait, you have a standard romance voice? <laughs> that, I mean, it's like, the, it just assumes so much. Like, first, it assumes that I've listened to your other books. And in most cases, I have not. Like, I don't know what your voice sounds like, period. I don't know what your what a standard romance voice is. And three... <laughs> Like the author has given us this idea of who this person is. So what do you what do you mean it's your standard romance, romance voice? Yeah. Like I don't I don't know what that means. Like just send me a a clip. <laughs> like for the love of God, send me something so that I can know what it is you're doing. Um so it's but I I think I might be the outlier on that because it's happened enough times that I'm like, maybe I'm the weird one that like I want to approach every book like it's new and different. And like, I, I don't have what I would call it like, oh, it's my standard narration voice. Or it's just like, or it just sounds like me. Because a lot of people listen to the interviews or like podcasts that I've done. And they're like, it's weird that he doesn't sound like Ox. Or it's weird that he doesn't sound like this other person. And it's like, well, because the author put, gives you so much to work with. Why not? Why not embrace it? So like, I don't... I couldn't email somebody and be like, oh, just do my standard voice. Cause I don't know what that is. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what book to send them to be like, listen to this sample from audible and you'll know what this I'm is doing. my standard. Right. Like I, that, I don't know what that is. I'm over a hundred books in and I haven't standardized, I guess maybe by Which 200, I'll have a standard, but yeah. So that was, that's just me bitching. Sorry. <laughs> But it's the no, truth. It's like fine. sometimes, sometimes dual narration is really hard because if the communication is not good, um, if and I'm not saying this is true, but sometimes my perception is that that person doesn't care as much about the work that's being done. 
uh, if you know, because it still happens. It happens when I'm talking to people out in the real world who aren't audiobooks or romance listeners. You know, they think romance is a little silly. And so the perception that I get sometimes from working with other people is that like, it's just a romance. Mm-hmm. Like you can just like, you know, I'm just doing my romance thing. And it's like, I don't know. It takes I don't, skill like, to do banter, like to do the communication between mm-hmm. the two characters. It takes talent. Yeah. Or like the inner monologue and making like the, this very popular in romance. It's mm-hmm. really hard. Or even the steamy scenes. Yeah. Like you don't know what you're doing. It can sound really corny really fast and you're like oh no 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 mm-mm, no you don't know what you're doing right and it, like i i believe there needs to be an authenticity in first of all in casting um which is a, a rabbit hole we won't go down but i i do think that a byproduct of not having of having somebody who doesn't identify with the character that they're playing in any way shape or form leads to that sort of I'll say it, laziness. And um, I have been lucky enough to do a ton of queer stories, but I would hope that when I've done my male-female romances, that I have tried to connect to that character as a real human being, not just as like a, a tropey stereotype of like the leading man. And I think sometimes that's what we end up with in romance Mm -hmm. and yet it that is also in an in and of itself apparently very popular i feel like um the lgbt romance space in terms of audiobooks is still growing you're still getting new voices added to the mix on the indie and the traditionally published side Mm -hmm. but when you go over into mf or het romance the audiobook development i mean they're pushing out like some like real by kennedy ryan i know just one yeah. And, audio, and that audiobook is phenomenal. Yeah. And like, I want to see more audiobooks in the LGBT space. Like, I know a couple authors that are really prolific on their audiobooks, but even so, like, the library, even for MM and then FF, are still kind of growing and still kind of gaining traction. So, I wonder mm-hmm. too, um, as you are a big, big narrator in the MM space, do you find more and more authors like writing? like knowing that like they have you in mind to narrate their book how do you have like that where you notice like maybe like tj clooney includes like a little thing Mm -hmm. about a character that he knows that you will really enjoy narrating um i know tj does not do that because (laughs) tj well he's he's been very forthright with the fact that he does not listen to the audiobooks really Um, (laughs) yeah he'll he'll listen to bits and pieces just to make sure that nothing's like wildly incorrect Um, but otherwise he does not like to hear his own words read back to him. So he, he just doesn't engage with the audiobooks that way. Um, I think he listens a lot to his fans about whether or not they enjoy something. Mm-hmm. So, uh, other authors have, I, I don't know that I could say they've written to my voice, but they have certainly approached me saying like, I know that this character I've written, you can do them justice. And, and I don't think they're just buttering me up because when I get the character, I see what they mean. Like it just, it makes sense to me that they would come uh, to me for what I've, what I've become known for, uh, which is a, I don't know, like I hate being like, this is what I'm known for. (laughs) But what I strive to be is a very empathetic, detail oriented narrator who can embrace both the humor of a story, but also really thrives in the quiet, sad, heartbreaking moments. Yeah, well, some had me in tears. <laughs> when some of the characters that I'm like, oh, Kurt, why'd, yeah. you, why'd you have to do that? I was like, ah. Oh, well, because I was in dramatic painful. interpretation in high school, and that's what I know. <laughs> in fact, sometimes like, I've had to train myself. One of the things I've learned as I've done more and more audiobooks is like, maybe sometimes it doesn't need to be so sad. Like, if you think about this sentence differently, it could actually be funny. And maybe go with that lighthearted take every now and again. Maybe it doesn't always have to be so serious and so sad. It's okay. So The, the narrator can rip out my heart in a stomp on it. As long as you put it back together, since it is a romance. Right. 
and 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 we get our happily ever after. So like I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm okay with that. You can you can drag us listeners to the mud, but just <laughs> oh, I always a happy will. place by the end. Yeah, I mean, if somebody just sent me a straight up like happy book, I'd be like, why me? <laughs> if I'm not getting choked up in the booth, if I don't have to stop to let a tear roll down my cheek, why am I even doing this book? Like it needs, yeah. I I I like having those heavy, serious moments in an audiobook. But I also, I mean, I like contrast. So I think the best books have that and some humor that can break up some, sometimes the things that are just a bummer. But such well-written bummers. <laughs> I've gotten to do some really cool, <laughs> really cool, sad stuff. Oh, no. I'm into it. But two, I was wondering, do you have any funny recording stories or any memorable performances from any of your audiobooks that you do that you always like to go back to? Or... If you, if, or another question is, are there any audiobooks that you, if you got the chance to re-record, which ones and why? Wolf Song. <laughs> I'd re-record Wolf Song. TJ Klune, make this happen. Yeah. I mean, I think that contract's up in like a year. So it's a, it was a seven-year contract and I'm like, he can just renew it. It's not a big deal. But there's a part of me that's like, could I just do that again? <laughs> Knowing everything I know now, just so that like the book again that most people have heard me do is not the very first thing i've ever done because i mean i'm i'm so grateful that the book has gotten me work and has been embraced and people love it um but when i've listened to bits and pieces of it i'm like oh i hear what could have been done better mm-hmm. that being said it laid the foundation for the next three books i learned a ton during that process i don't think i'm ever going to go back and re-record it but i certainly would if I had the chance, if somebody was Maybe like, we'll, we'll pay you to take him. another cha- another pass at this, I'd be like, great. Put it on my calendar. Maybe we can convince TJ Plume to start a Kickstarter and say, we want a He doesn't need a Kickstarter. <laughs> He's, to get the fan engagement. He's doing great. Don't worry. If TJ Clune ever starts a Kickstarter, I will be the first one on Twitter dragging his ass because he does not need that. He's fine. He's fine. And are there any memorable performances from any of the audiobooks that you have done that you that kind of or characters that kind of still have stuck with you to today? This is going to be a weird answer, but recently the one that I think I'm the most proud of is not a romance. It's not even YA. It was a middle grade book about really about a football player that was written by a football player. Um but it was it's written by Tim Green, who was a player in the NFL, who uh, was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, and lost a lot of his function and had had children who were very interested in sports. Um, and there's still some question about whether or not his condition was caused by the concussions that he got playing in the NFL. Um, and what he did is he wrote a book called The Final Season that uh, was pretty autobiographical um, about his his child. I think it was a compilation of his children, but he wrote it in the form of his child dealing with his dad, finding out that his dad got ALS and whether or not he should continue playing football and the challenges that came along with it. And I still, to this day, think they accidentally emailed the wrong narrator to give me that book. I do not know why somebody would think that was my gig, but they gave it to me and I did it. And it was so different from anything I've done. And I I just really enjoyed it. And I'm proud of that performance because it was a departure for me. Um, I'm I'm always going to be really proud of the that final TJ Klune book, Brother Song, um, because he he didn't take it easy on me. I mean, he I don't want to ruin it for people who might still be doing it. But like there are flashbacks to the very first book and I had to go back to the very first book and be like all right how did i say that (laughs) because it's like line for line a scene from the previous from that very first book and i was like Mm -hmm. i have to go back and try to try to make it um resemble what i had done before but with the knowledge that i have now of how to do it better which is part of why i say like i would redo that book because i just know better now Mm -hmm. um so like i'm i'm i'll always be proud of that performance because i think i think i landed it well and it it was probably the first series I ever finished. I don't know. I mean, I hope I'm proud of every performance I've given. Some books you just spend a little more time with just because they're longer um, or because it's a series you get to spend time with with the characters. 
Uh, and to a certain degree, I, I hope that the book I'm the proudest of is the one that I've just finished because I, I should be getting better and better and more comfortable with each and every project that I finish. And two, um, I was really curious about how long does it take you to record? I would say, like, let's say like a normal, like maybe six to 10 hour audio book. Does it take you like two or three days or a whole week? Uh <laughs> Well, there are some factors that will change that. Um, typically, when I'm in the booth, I can record about an hour of audio in about an hour and a half, which is not a bad ratio. Like any anything, if you can get an hour of audio in under two hours, you're in really good shape, like finished audio. Um, so in that in that way, I'm pretty fast. My problem is I can't always get myself to the place where I feel like I'm doing a good job. Like there's the internal voices being like, oh, you you just can't record right now because you're not totally committed to it. And you're not like, and I need to learn to get past that because I think I have enough muscle memory now, enough skill set that like, if I just got in the booth and gave it 10 minutes, I'm sure I could like find my way, find my way there. Um, and there's like mental health stuff that gets in the way, especially the last two years. Mm -hmm. Like there are six hour books that took me three weeks. And, it, and it's not because of anything other than the fact that I was like, I can't. I just can't. I can't. It, with what's happening in the world right now, I cannot go sit in a booth and read about a romance. My brain can't do it. I'm sorry. Email everybody and be like, I'm behind schedule. I'm sorry. I can't do this. I'll let you know when I get to it. So, but for the most part, a standard six to eight hour audiobook would be about a week of work, including the prep time. If everything in my life is going well, okay. <laughs> which again... <laughs> For the last two and a half years, I don't know what week that was. And like the thing about narrating is when I got into it, I had no idea how much work and energy it takes. It seems so silly because like I'm sitting and like I'm in a booth and I the microphone's six inches from my face. So it's not even like I have to project or like bring that much vocal energy but to emote for that much time every day, to be concentrating on the text and trying to make sure I'm getting that right, and then looking over here to make sure that my waveforms are, are doing what they're supposed to do and I'm getting my levels where they need to be within spec, uh, and then listening for any extraneous noises that might be coming into the booth that I need to stop and go back. It's like, your brain is working so hard. At the end of a full day of recording, I am exhausted. And, and, I, and I know it's not just me, like there are, I can point you to people who have done hundreds more books than me who who will tweet about how tired they are at the end of the day still. Like there's just some some resistance that you can never build up because it's just if you're doing if you're really invested in the work, it's going to take it out of you every time. And so there's also a limit like sometimes I've had to get like four finished hours done in a day and I'm in that booth for 10 hours and it, like, there's just no other way to do it. So I do it. But by the end of those few days, like I need almost a week off because like you, you just, you kill yourself mentally and emotionally. And also for what it's worth, it's not great for your body to just be sitting, sitting for that long, for that long either. Like, yeah. so like you have to take breaks, you have to get up, you have to move around, you have to stretch. And it's like, ugh. ideally, like there'd be time to go to the gym and all that stuff that would be like good for me, but yeah, it's not happening at the moment. <laughs> so we'll see. I am really hoping for some semblance of a normal life. It doesn't have to look like pre 2020, but it would be super nice <laughs> if I could get to a, a point again when like I can see people when I need to see people. Um, cause even though I'm a pretty introverted person, I think being surrounded by friends and loved ones does fill my cup mm -hmm. and it's felt like a long time since that cup has been full, I, you know, and I you can't understand. like, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be married and have like, we have dogs now and like, they bring a lot to my life, but like, it can't all be on them. Mm -hmm. Like, and it can't be on like the small group of friends that you can see. Cause like, they're also going through it and they're also tired. And so yeah, like, I can't wait to go. Like, I went to uh, my hometown last week because my friends had directed a high school show of Mamma Mia, which was exactly as good as you would think it would be. And um, But what was great about it is that it was the first time in over two years that I saw some people that I used to see every couple weeks 
because I would just run into them or we did theater together. So every couple months we were spending like intense amount of time together. And it was like seeing these people who I genuinely really liked some of them loved and realizing I was like, Oh yeah, that's what we lost over the last Mm -hmm. few years. We lost those casual connections, those people that we liked, but we didn't make an effort to see because they were just like in our orbit. Mm -hmm. And it was just so life-giving to see those people for the first time in, in years. And so I know that we, we won't ever go back to normal, but if we could get to the point where like I can see people in my orbit <laughs> again, that would be really good for me. And I do have a fun question for you. Um, are there any fun um, tropes within romance? Because you have narrated quite a few near, um, romance books. What are some of your favorite tropes? That if you see a manuscript come your way, you're like, oh... You get really excited to start on that book. I like forced proximity. I like <laughs> I like friends to enemies to lovers. Oh, I like I when they've like that. had a had a previous relationship, but then had a falling out, so now they're enemies. But then also there's that spark of familiarity from the first time they knew each other, and then it turns into something more. That I like. Cool. I'm gonna need some recommendations for that for that okay. specific trope. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'm I'm just too salty a bitch that like enemies to lovers I don't buy it because I hold a grudge. <laughs> like if you did something and I don't like and I didn't like it like I don't I don't need more friends thank you goodbye. But like if we were friends and I can remember how nice it was before and like there were good moments that are worth revisiting and we just had like a tiff I could I could see getting <laughs> to you get past that. Yeah, the next level. And again, I work with great authors and many of them make even the craziest tropes seem authentic. I mean, I've I have been a Russian bear five times over, bear shifter, like <laughs> because of a, a whole series I did where I was like five different bear shifters from the same family and like they somehow make it work. <laughs> Even when it's ridiculous. And I yeah. I mean that in the best possible way. It's ridiculous. But they give them some heart. They give them a sense of family and a sense of home and 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 the love comes through. But That's I can't amazing. relate to that. I can't I can't like authentically bring my Russian <laughs> bear shifter mafia past to the book. To the book. Into the book. But I feel comfortable doing it because I know nobody else can either. I think too, this is a question I think you're definitely looking forward to. Any upcoming releases? Yes. And they live. <laughs> Yes. That you want to tell us about or put on on everyone's radar. Yes, everyone. If you haven't already, because by the time this interview comes out, the book should have been out for several weeks. If you haven't already, go get the book, preferably the audiobook, of And They Lived, dot, 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 by Stephen Salvatore. It is a new adult romance, which means it's, it's, new, adult? Hap- it's new adult. So it's like college age, not so high steamy? school. So, so it's steamy. I thought it's it was YA. Se- it's sex positive. It's technically like under the Bloomsbury YA umbrella, but it's oh, new but it's adult. Like upper, upper it's YA. new adult. It gets steamy. It is a character that I have related to in a way that is like so, so much of me was in this character. Um, and of course, that's not true. It's not like Stephen interviewed me and was like, I'm going to write you a book. But yeah. like I related <laughs> to so much of, of who this character was. Um, you know, he has body positivity issues and uh, he is a confident queer person who is also like not at all confident in any other ways of his life. Um, the character is is dealing uh, with some questions about his gender, which I have to admit is not something I have gone through. Um, but it was written so well that like I loved experiencing that journey through the character. Um, he's also creative. He's an artistic. He's a an animation major at his first year in college, and so like he's also like creating. He's a storyteller, and I was just like I I read the blurb. And like could not find who to email at Bloomsbury and finally just like gave up and DM'd the author. And I was like, hey, if there's any way that you can put my name in for this, please do. And this was like pre Under the Whispering Door. So I was even like, I'm narrating Under the Whispering Door for TJ Clune. And that's a Macmillan book. And it's in the, (laughs) like, it's going to be getting getting a lot of attention uh, around fall of uh, of 2021. So uh, (laughs) please hire me. Um, And to his credit, he, 
I, I'm hoping did his due diligence and like listened to some of my stuff and liked it. And then like did tell his editor that like, Hey, there's this narrator who wants to do it. And that was like, it came to me. So lesson in life, kids, sometimes you got to go for the things you want. That's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Any other um, like indie titles that you have narrated um, besides, because I just traditionally published that Mm -hmm. you have on deck that you're really excited for people to get their hands on as well. Um, I'm in, I'm still working in the middle of, um, I get the series names mixed up. It's just hard. There's so many series, Charles. (laughs) There's so many. Okay, what is that one called? Uh, it's the Fire and Brimstone series. Oh, okay. I, so I see you it's Nicole Knight. Yes. Yeah, so I think three books are out. Four and five are forthcoming pretty quickly. Six I'm going to get to in sp- a, a little later this spring. Um, really proud of the work that I'm doing in that one. And it's one of the rare opportunities where it's a series, but it's not an anthology. So I've been narrating the same person for four books, going on five books. Uh, it will be six books. So I've really gotten the chance to actually get to know this character and grow with him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm loving that because that's oh, that's man. rare in romance uh, to that's get to amazing. have the same voice for a series. Um, it's a very slow burn romance. It's also fantasy, uh, but well worth the time. And it's getting steamy. So if you hang in there. Oh, it's a slow burn. It's a slow burn, but it gets steamy. So I'm gonna hold you to that. Like if I start the series and it doesn't get steamy, expect a DM. Book so four. Like Just wait. It, it takes until book four. <sighs> That's three, four books. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just letting you know. I, I, I'm just I, I, letting you just, know. If you let me know, then I'm I'm okay with that. And I'm really excited to have more people listen. Um, gosh, what is on the horizon? I don't know. The problem is like, I, I don't read the books much before I record them. So like I could be recording something two weeks from now that I might be really excited about. And I, ju- I don't know it yet because I, <laughs> I haven't prepped the book yet. Um, yeah. but I, I'm in, t- I'm so grateful that there are a lot of, uh, projects that have come my way, uh, both from authors that have worked with me before that are giving me new series that they're starting. Um, but also I'm getting to work with some new people who, who just reached out and, and wanted, wanted to work together. And that's always exciting. So I guess I would just say like, keep watching this space and we'll find out what comes next. Okay. And then my final question for you is any audiobooks that you want to recommend? It don't have to be necessarily narrowed by you. It could mm. be favorites that you have listened to in the past that you think are under hype. But it's always fun to hear what some of the narrators or with some of their favorite audiobooks that they listen to and enjoy. Yeah. Um, I, this is such a hard question because I, I do, I love audiobooks. I actually just did um, a whole post about this in my Facebook group uh, about the fact that I listen to a lot of memoirs because I, especially actor or performer memoirs, mm-hmm. are so much fun because uh, they know not only how to create a good story, but they know how to deliver it. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you want to know what those recommendations are, join my Facebook group. It's called Kurt's audiobook fair. And I list a bunch of my favorite, uh, actor memoirs, which are really fun listens, specifically listens. I mean, I suppose it's fun to read the book too, but like, listen to their voice Voice. reading the book. Um, the last book that really like grabbed me by the throat and was like, you will listen to this until it's done was, uh, the sky blues by Robbie Couch, narrated by Michael Crouch. And yes, that's confusing. But that book is excellent, and it has several turns in it that I did not see coming and was just a lot of fun to listen to. Um, I The very, very first audiobook that taught me what audiobooks could be was A Discovery of Witches, which is a romance in its own way. It's a fantasy and a romance. Uh, it's also historical fiction and sort of like urban fantasy. It's so many things, it, but it's a brilliant series of three books, brilliantly narrated. And it was the first time I really understood that like an audiobook could be like a play in your mind. 
Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. people who like what I do should go listen to that book. Cause it's what taught me to do what I do. Oh. It's what I was thinking about when I was recording Wolf song. Oh, I was also going to say, I have to always give credit to Joel Leslie, Joel Leslie Frumkin, who was my very first audiobook coach and taught me a lot and oh. continues to be a great friend and advocate. Um, I love when he does sassy British things. Um, so the amazing blue billings and it's sequel, I think was called the quiet house. Oh, by Some Louis of my Morton. favorite listens of the last year. So good. He is so good at snarky British. But thank you so much, Kerr, for coming on my channel. Like, I love getting to talk to you, getting to hear your thoughts about your audio, uh, hear, just hear about your career more, because I've been a long time listener of yours, and it feels like kind of full circle that I'm actually getting the chance to interview you. So like, thank you again so much for coming on my channel. It truly was my pleasure. It was so nice getting to chat with you as well. So I feel like we barely scratched the surface. Hey, we can, you know what? You're, you're always welcome to come back on my channel at any time. Right. Just like DM me and when let me know, and then, and then we can set up. <laughs> but um, for you guys watching, if you want to find all of Kurt's social media links, they'll be all down in the description box down below. His Instagram, his Facebook group, all that will be down below. So definitely go give him a check. Go follow him on all the different social medias. Go check out his audiobook. You will not be disappointed. But thank you guys again so much for watching this video, and I'll catch you guys with a brand new video. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.